Mad Fulton, The End of an Error. After more than 550 issues and 67 years, Mad Magazine is coming to an end, and we're talking exclusively with members of the usual gang of idiots. On this episode of Pop Goes the Culture, Mad artist Tom Richmond gives us his thoughts on the end of Mad. I'm David Levin, and this is Pop Goes the Culture. David Levin, and welcome to Pop Goes the Culture, and we are continuing our series of uh, interviews with the usual gang of idiots from Mad Magazine, and today I am very happy to have with me Mr. Tom Richmond. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, so, Tom, you've, you've been at Mad, you've, you've become a staple um, at, at Mad, not the staple in the magazine itself, perhaps, <laughs> but but a staple of the magazine, and uh, uh, talk to me about about how you got started at Mad Magazine. When did when did that happen for you? Um, well, my first piece appeared in the fall of 2000, so I was almost at 20 years, uh, about 19. Uh, I started sending work to Mad back in uh, the late 1990, no, or 1999, and uh, I did a little work for Mad uh, Clone Cracked Magazine, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late nineties and, uh, early 2000. And uh, I just kept sending my work to Matt. I kept sending my work to him and eventually, uh, they gave me an opportunity. Now you have been working as a caricaturist at like amusement parks and on the streets and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yeah, that was, that was my summer job when I was going to college. Actually, I got a job at a six flags theme park and I drew, <clears throat> excuse me, caricatures, uh, every summer all the way through college, and it was uh, that was my introduction to the art of caricature, actually. I'd always wanted to be a cartoonist and, a, and an artist, but I didn't really have a direction or something that, you know, really clicked for me that I felt was was uh, kind of a specialty or something that I could concentrate on until I got that, that summer job, and, and I fell in love with the art of caricature, and, you know, what, what better place to do caricatures than, than Mad Magazine? So... Had you been reading it as a kid? I I loved it as a kid. Uh, my I, my parents wouldn't let me read it. Actually, really? Yeah, they they wouldn't let me buy it. So uh, a neighbor kid uh, was a buddy of mine had a subscription, and every time his uh, issue came in, then he would call me with some secret code, and I'd run over there and we'd uh, pour over the magazine, and uh, you know we loved Don Martin and we loved. Uh, all the, uh, the, this was probably around maybe fourth grade, mm -hmm. fifth grade. So I was, you know, what, 11, 12 years old. And, um, but I loved every part of the magazine, including stuff I didn't get, you know, yeah. like I remember laughing about the, at the drawings of, um, the one flew over the cuckoo's nest movie parody, you know, and I didn't, I wasn't going to see that movie for another 10 years yeah. before I was old enough to see it. But it's just there was something wonderful about on, on every page. It was something I ate up as a kid. For me, it was uh, Midnight Wow Boy, which <laughs> was not a film you would see at the age of 9 or 10 by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, exactly. you know, somehow I learned, uh, you know, was, I was seeing John Boy. I think it was Mort Drucker must have drawn that one way back in the day. Yeah, I remember the art for that. Yeah, John Voigt, Mort, Mort did that one. Do um, you remember the very first issue that you ever looked at or the first uh, cover that you looked at? <clears throat> not not specifically the first one. Um, I guess I remember that that parody of, of uh, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, for some reason, stuck in my head. Right. Um, I don't know whether it was because here I was I was reading something that was clearly a, you know meant for adults, and I was I got to read it at eleven years old or whatever, and so I thought I was you know it was almost like uh, you know sneaking a Playboy or something. You're you're able to you're, you're you're experiencing something that adults are only supposed to see, right? And uh, so I can't it. remember what was on the cover of that one, but I just remember that that particular parody really sticking out in my head. But there was so much stuff, you know, um, and it was always such a, an interesting, diverse 
amount of cartooning in there. You know, you'd have these wonderful illustrations by George Woodbridge and, and Mort and Jack Davis. And, uh, and then you'd have the goofy, uh, crazy stuff that Don Martin would do or Sergio. Um, it was like a little mini animation festival in every issue. It was just, it was, there was nothing like it. That's true. How much, when you were, when you were looking at that stuff and you were sort of aiming to become a cartoonist yourself, was there, were there influences? Did you find yourself copying the guys? I mean, what would, you know, like there's, there's those of us who sort of read it and said, okay, I'm going to learn how to, about humor. I'm going to learn about rebelling against authority or I'm going to learn about this, that, or the other thing. But for artists, I have to imagine it's a different, it's a different level of, of uh, study without even being aware mm-hmm. that you're studying it. What were, you, what were you looking at? What was influencing you? What were you copying? Well, when I was a, when I was a kid reading it, uh, Don Martin was my favorite stuff in there. Interesting. So I, so I would draw lots of Don Martin drawings with the floppy feet and the big noses <laughs> and, and, and all that stuff. But my buddy and I, we would do our own TV parodies uh, that we would draw. And of course we were doing, you know, Gilligan's Island or, uh, uh, you know, my favorite Martian or something like that. Right. Some syndicated shows that we would watch after school. Um, so I was looking at Mort's work. I was looking at Jack Davis's work, but as a kid, you know, not, it, you didn't realize how brilliant that stuff was. And it just was really funny, cool drawings. Mm-hmm. And then, I got away from mad, you know, like everybody kind of does eventually you sort of move on to other things. And, and, uh, when I got that job doing caricatures, I went to the, the theme park and I, I roomed with a bunch of other caricaturists and these guys all had stacks of mad magazines laying around. Yeah. And I started looking through them and going and thinking, wow, was the artwork this brilliant when I was reading it, you know, it 10 was. years ago. Right. And I, so I pull out all my old mad magazines when I get home and I was like, yeah, I could, didn't really realize how incredible the cartoonists were that worked for that magazine. I mean, it's just a who's who of, of the best of the best. Wally Wood and Will Elder and Mort Trucker and Jack Davis and Woodbridge. And I mean, it, it's, the list just keeps going on and on. So then when I was reintroduced to Matt is when I really started studying the art, you know, at about 18, 19, when I got that job, um, then I was looking at Mort's work and I, I went back to some of the, the older stuff and I, I, you know, Wally Woods cartooning and, and, uh, uh, the early, um, uh, Jack Davis stuff and Will Elder stuff. And I was blown away. So that's when I, that's when it started creeping in to influence my, my own work was a little later. So what's really interesting is, is, uh, you, you tell a sort of a, a fanciful version of your, of your career trajectory on your website. Um, you didn't make it in on your first time. As very few people do. You didn't make it in your first time at Mad Magazine, did you? No, no, not at all. Tell me, fact, tell me that was, progression. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it was kind of a funny, uh, longer, uh, or the, 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 the story of my getting in is interesting because I was very sneaky about it. Uh, at the time, I was working on, uh, or I was the president of the National Caricaturist Network, which was an organization of, of caricature artists. And I was president 98, 99, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would often um, have these little conventions or these little events. And we had one in New Britain, Connecticut in the, I think the spring of 99, um, Al Hirschfeld was opening a show, uh, like a retrospective of his work that was going to travel around and it was opening in this little museum in New Britain, Connecticut. Wow. And so we had this little event for these caricature artists and we all went there and we often have a, a guest speaker. So I got Sam Viviano's, uh, contact information from a directory of illustration that I was also in. And I called him and asked him if he would be a guest speaker. Well, he had just become the art director of Mad Magazine. So I thought, oh boy, I've got, <laughs> I've got the art director of Mad Magazine all to myself. You know, I, he's going to be there the whole weekend. So I did a parody uh, that I wrote and drew myself of um, 
the movie Godzilla uh-huh. with Matthew Broderick. Right. Uh, that reboot from uh, 97 or something like that. Right. So I, I wrote and drew the whole thing to show Sam. And uh, I showed it to him, you know, and he looked at it. He was very encouraging. He said, well, this, I see a lot of nice, nice stuff here, but I don't think you're quite, you know, at the, at the mad point. So just keep doing work and keep sending it to me. I'd love to see you, you know, progression of your, of your skills. Funny thing was, I sent that Godzilla parody to Cracked Magazine and they published it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I had to rewrite the ending a little bit. But it appeared in like like two issues later. It was in the magazine, and wow. uh, yeah. Then I ended up doing uh, parodies for Cracked. I did an X Men. I think the first X Men movie, mm-hmm. and uh, I actually wrote um, a Sopranos parody for Cracked at that time too. And that was that I drew. A friend of mine helped me with the script, and then I also did. I remember the last one I did for him was Gladiator with Russell Crowe. But every time I would do one of these, I would send, you know, I would send it to Matt right. and say, here's my latest. And I showed him that Gladiator parody at the National Cartoon Society of uh, Rubin Awards. I I'd just become a member and it was in New York and I showed it to Sam and, and Nick Meglin. And they said, uh, oh, you know, we really see like your stuff is really starting to pop. Uh, mm-hmm. We'd love to use you in Mad, but. The, the problem is you can't be in Mad and Cracked at the same time. And I said, well, that's that's not a problem. I don't work for Cracked anymore. And he said, really? When, when did that happen? And I said, three seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm not, we, we can't guarantee you that we'll get you any work. Because the way it worked with those guys back then is that they had, you know, their A-list of artists. Right. And they got all the jobs, and then if they were all busy and they had something else, then they'd kind of go down to the next tier of people that's, that appeared in a few issues a year, but maybe not every issue. So it, it, it would sometimes take a long time to work your way down to new people that they would give a try to. So they said, I can't guarantee when we'll give you the job. And I said, that's okay. You know, I kind of had it with Cracked at that time. It was... It wasn't really cracked. It was after it had been bought by American Media and, mm-hmm. you know, all the real people behind the magazine were long gone. So I, so I said, uh, don't worry. I'm not doing any more pieces. I'll just wait for your call. And um, and then they called me, like, probably a month later, and I did a piece, and then I did another piece, and eventually I started being in every issue. You got to be one of the, one of the usual gang of idiots. <laughs> yeah. What did that feel like at first? I mean, you know, like a lot of the people that I've that I've spoken to, you know, and, and I've known Joe and Charlie for decades, and and uh, you came in sort of after Bill had passed away, I guess, and you were sort of the next, literally the next generation. I I, I think there's like three generations: the generation from the very beginning, then the generation who sort of came in in the mm-hmm. late '70s, early '80s, uh, and then you sort of I think, I think the, the 90s after Bill and once DC sort of absorbed Mad Magazine, you came in, in during that period, I guess. What was it like at Mad at that point? Well, I, I was very lucky that I that I started when I did because in, in 2000, it was still very much a Gaines era Matt, Mm -hmm. you know, even though he had been gone for 10 years or something like that already, uh, Nick Meglin was still a main editor and John Ficarra were the main editors. Charlie and Joe had been there for 10 years already. And these guys had all worked for Bill, you know, and under that and during that, that time when it was, when it, when Mad was at its height of its powers, or if, if you want to say that. Mm-hmm. So I kind of got, you know, I was part of that a little bit at the end. Um, whereas some of the, you know, later people that came on board, I, they didn't really get to, to experience Mad the way it was back in those days. Right. So I feel very lucky, especially that I got to work with Nick Megan. I mean, John Ficarra is amazing and was terrific to work with for so long. But Nick really was an integral part, if not the most integral part of the Gaines era mad. And uh, 
he was, you know, he, I think it was about four years after I started that he, that he retired. So I really got a chance to work with him and it was, it was amazing. Nick was, was one of a kind and really a character. And I was sad when he passed away because I didn't get to do one of these with him. But everybody seems to have a Nick Meglin story. Do you have a Meg, Nick Meglin story? Oh, yeah. There's lots of Nick Meglin stories. Uh, my favorite one is when I first started working for, for MAD. And, and Nick was one of the guys that really helped me come into MAD. And I remember I went to New York. This isn't part of the story, but I went to New York. Before I started with Matt, and I, I showed him some more of my stuff, and they took me to lunch. Sam and Nick did mm -hmm. at the Society of Illustrators. And one of the things that, that they were concerned about with me was that they thought my work was too Mort Drucker influenced. Interesting. And and I, I totally could see that because when I started, you know, researching, hey, I want to do movie parodies for Matt, who else do you look at, right? Right. So I'm looking at Mort's work. I'm not consciously copying his work, but, you know, it's Fair. it's like, going getting into my dna and everything uh -huh. and nick said to me look we don't want another more drucker we want the best Tom richmond we can get so you need to you know sort of step away from the mort influence and 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 really concentrate on your own voice and that's when i put away all my mads i stopped looking at them and i started just doing these parodies for cracked and other work without any you know looking at mort's compositions and things like that i stopped doing that and then they started seeing what they wanted to see. But very shortly after I started working for Mad, we, I went to New York for, they used to have a holiday party every year yeah. at the Society. So and my best. wife and I, yeah, they were great. My wife and I would go there and um, stay in New York for a couple of days in December, and we would go to this party. And I went to the offices the, the, the uh, first time I went there for the party to visit and I'm down at the end of the hallway, which is where the production department was. And they've got all these flat files there full of artwork. And they're showing me Jack Davis pieces, you know, from the sixties that they had in there and, and all this amazing stuff. And, uh, I'm in there with Sam and, and some of the art guys. And all of a sudden I hear from down the hall, Nick's voice just booming saying, Richmond's here. Where is that hack? And then he's storming down the hallway. I, I look, I look out the, the door down the hall, and here's Nick storming down the hallway like this. And all the other editors are coming out in his wake, you know, because they're going to want to see him go haze the new guy. And he comes, and he comes slamming into the art department, and he gets right in my face, and he said, "Richmond, I want you to know, I don't like your work." I don't like your drawing. I don't like your inking. I don't like your compositions. I don't like the way you tell stories. I don't like your shoes. What do you think of that? <laughs> and I looked at him, and everybody was looking at me, and I said, what's wrong with my shoes? <laughs> and then Nick, exactly and Nick started right laughing. Answer. Yeah, he started laughing, and he did this thing where he would grab you by the back of your, he your head and yeah. go, how you doing? You know, and just like that. And he, when you got insulted by Nick Meglin, you knew you were part of the family. You were part of the family. I felt the same yeah. way. Nick was, Nick was the best. One time, <laughs> one time he went overboard with me and I was like, and I said to Charlie, um, I, I said, Charlie, I, I don't know if Nick really likes me. <laughs> the next time I went up to the office, Nick came over to me and he goes, are we okay? Are we okay, David? I, I, I just, you know, we love you here, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I know. <laughs> he, he was like, if I went over the, he's like, I'm sorry if I crossed the line. And he did, you know, but I was just, he was, I was having a sensitive day, you know, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, spoke to Charlie about it. And, and it was like one of those, one of those things. I miss, I miss Nick, Nick tremendously. But, you know, I think what you said about him being part of that, that sort of, um, well, as, as as Bill Gates called him, the soul of mad. I think John would agree with you. You know, John wouldn't take mm -hmm. any umbrage at the fact that that you say that Nick was uh, Nick was so much of of that. Um, the the now you Man Magazine uh, moved to Burbank recently, and uh, in the, a couple of years ago, and they closed the New York office after you know six. 60 some odd years, and that whole lineage of, you know, Tinker's Average Chance 
James and Feldstein to Meglin and, and Takara, uh, kind of got a reboot. <clears throat> and, mm-hmm. uh, and they brought in Bill Morrison and a whole new gang of idiots, I guess, if, if they could be called that. And, and not everybody made, made the switch over. You and a couple of other artists and a couple of other mainstays did continue to work or mad. Uh, you know, and so you know in a way that maybe Charlie and Joe and some of the other guys don't. What was it like sort of making that transition to the new folk in the new place? Well, it was it was hard because the the thing that concerned me the most about the move, of course, none of the none of the people from Mad, you know, came along. Right. Uh, and of course they didn't. You know, they're all lifelong New Yorkers and and they just weren't interested in moving to the West coast and, and, uh, and continuing to do what they did. And my big concern was, uh, nobody working at mad is, will have even met Bill Gaines Mm -hmm. or had been part of that era at all. Um, and that concerned me because there's a certain sensibility to it that just isn't something you just sort of, you know, oh, uh, here's the formula. Let's just go with that. Right. Um, I mean, there's a type of humor and a, a line that doesn't get crossed, you know, and uh, there's just a whole bunch of things. It's just very, uh, all, it's all institutional sort of wisdom and that's handed down, you know. And since nobody was part of that, I just was very concerned that the mad voice was going to be lost. Uh, I was very enthusiastic, though, when I found out that Bill Morrison was going to be the, the head editor, executive editor, I guess is his official title. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I'd known Bill for a long time. Uh, Bill's very smart. He knows humor. And more importantly, he is sort of a historian of Mad Magazine. You know, he he understood the mad voice. Uh, if anybody could have done it without having been, you know, given an opportunity to work with those guys for years beforehand, mm-hmm. I thought Bill had a chance of being able to do it. So with Bill in charge, I had I had high hopes. Uh, but um, some of the things they did worked, you know, and they had some sharp stuff. Uh, some stuff just wasn't, to me, uh, fit in the mad vein and so it was sort of a mixed bag but for me it wasn't so bad because i do movie and tv parodies and they're sort of you know a staple and and that stuff didn't really change much but you know some of the other stuff i you know was like yeah i just don't know if this is really mad like you know but um but they were in an impossible position i mean those all of them were just you know told to take over this almost 70 year old institution without having gotten a chance to, to learn how it really worked and, and, and get the, you know, the nuts and bolts of it under their belt. So I thought they did a fine job given the situation. Okay. Why do you think it ended up, um, if, you, if you care to comment on it, why do you think they, they decided to, um, that it's a fold? <laughs> it is, I, I've been folding that for years. With the mm-hmm. Jackson, but why do you yeah. think they, they decided to, uh, Fold the magazine. Well, let's see. They uh, uh, circulation was up in the last three years. It went from one hundred and twenty thousand copies an issue to one hundred and fifty. Social media engagement was off the charts compared to what it used to be. Start was getting all sorts of press uh, and and good positive press from like the Ghastly Gun Tiny's piece that had just been that and that had been nominated for uh, for an Eisner. The magazine was nominated for an Eisner for the first time that I remember. Um, and uh, uh, that the cover of number four won a, a Rondo Hatton Award. Uh, so it was winning awards. Circulation was up. Uh, social media was up. Buzz was up. Everything was up. So, of course, they canceled it. <laughs> Typical mad, I guess. I, I, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, uh, when they when they let Bill go... I think we all knew that it was probably going to be over soon because he was the, you know, that he was the whole reason they actually got it out to, to LA. They found Bill and they thought, and we thought, Oh, they finally found their guy that is going to be able to, to, to actually pull this off. 
And then a year later, they, they dismissed him without yeah. any real explanation of any kind. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I'm still scratching my head over it. There were a whole lot of good things going on with it. You know, it was different, no question. But the, I think the goal was Mad had been going great. I mean, the guys in New York were at the top of their game. Yeah, totally. The yeah. Uh, the the political stuff, you know, was just brilliant, and it was getting all this attention too. Um, and uh, so, um, the, but the goal was they had to start introducing it to a new audience, you know, uh, and bringing on people who were who were younger and you know to just to just get get the audience younger and keep the you know perpetuate the magazine going forward and i thought they were accomplishing that you know they really were there was a new subscriptions you know the circulation was up it was getting talked about on social media with people that were under 40 years old you know <laughs> uh so things were things didn't seem to be okay so i guess i i i, I don't anyway it's we'll see what our, happens. It's, it's above our pay grade, Tom. That's exactly right. I just draw the funny pictures. You know, <laughs> they say draw this, and I do it, and then uh, that's the extent of my involvement. So, a little bit of buzz that I've heard, I guess, is that <clears throat> Mad is too valuable a franchise to kill off entirely. Uh, have you heard any rumors? Do you know anything, or what do you? What are your thoughts? Well. Um, Personally, I think that the Mad as a brand or as a as a property is more valuable if it's still producing content. Yeah, you know, if it's nothing but the old stuff, it just becomes strictly a nostalgia thing. And let's face it, I mean the 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 backlog, the library of work is what's really valuable uh, because it's some of the greatest comic humor, visual humor ever done in publication. So they've got all this stuff, but it's also been printed and reprinted ad nauseum. Yeah. You know, so so there's only so much mileage you can get out of that old stuff anyway. And if Mad still is, has got any kind of presence, uh, I just think it's a more valuable brand that way. So, yeah, you know, I, I can't I can't foresee it going away completely. Like I've heard, you know, rumors like everybody else about a, about an annual issue. Um. A mad look at the year, you know, at the end of the year, that's all new content. I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, I think that could be something that would be great. Um, you know, it's Mad's biggest problem over the last 15 years has been that it's a magazine. Yeah. And there's nothing they can do about that. You know, it, it, it is a magazine and it takes months to put an issue together and get it on the you know, on the, on the stands and, uh, this day and age, everything is instantaneous. You know, it's like something happens and there's, uh, 25 memes about it 10 minutes later. Um, but the one advantage mad has over that stuff is that it takes two months to put together. So <laughs> rather than trying to, you know, do mean type humor and, you know, Let's face, you know, a lot of times that stuff is just, you know, thrown together. Sure, it's funny, but it, it doesn't have any quality to it, you know. Here, you've got a chance to have, you know, somebody take two months to, to do a movie parody or to put together some piece of art that's that that's not that you don't get that uh, on the Internet, you know. So doing it at the end of the year where you just look back at the year, then the timeliness of it becomes a non-factor. And it's just mostly about what you have to say about it. So um, it could be like a, like it, Matt always was, a little mini uh, animation festival of stuff that, you know, is you, you just don't find it on the Internet because nobody can take the time to do it uh, and put it up there for nothing. And, and that makes it unique. You know, that's that's something that I think has a value. People would be willing to buy a copy of a book or a comic or something where really good craft, really good artists, really good cartoonists, really good writers spent months putting it together and, and put together a, a really high quality, terrific piece of publication. You know, why wouldn't somebody pay for that? 
Tom Richmond, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. I really hey, appreciate you your time. You are, again, of the new breed, one of my uh, favorite artists. Love love seeing your stuff. Love seeing oh, your you. your uh, non-mad stuff as well. Uh, and I know people can, uh, can condition you and get in touch with you. Where do they get in touch with you if they want to look more of your work, see more of your work and see you in person? Uh, they can follow my website, TomRichmond.com. I've got a blog. I, I write on it almost every day. Um, certainly share like what I've been up to lately when things come out. Um, yeah, I do a lot of other work besides MAD. I'll be doing a lot of other work besides MAD now, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, of necessity. Or, you know, yeah, comics, cartooning, uh, magazine stuff, and, and that type of thing. And I, I do a few conventions a year, not too many, but... Um, uh, and then I draw the, I do these workshops that have been a lot of fun the last few years where I teach people to do caricatures and I kind of go around the country and they're very small, you know, 12 students max and, and it's uh, a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm busy. I keep busy. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for doing the show today and uh, I hope you'll come back again. Hey, my pleasure, David. Anytime. Hey, it's David Levin. If you like Pop Goes the Culture and want to see more of it, don't forget to subscribe, click on one of these links, and please help us out on Patreon so that we can keep bringing more Pop Goes the Culture episodes to you.